webinar on the subject increasing political, ecological, economic, and regional importance of the Bay of Bengal for Bangladesh in the post-COVID-19 world. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, uh, high-powered panel with us today. Uh, I'll request, without further ado, hand over to Professor Milan Pago, the Vice Chancellor of the In Independent University of Bangladesh, for his welcome address. You're mute, you're mute. Professor, you're mute. Mute, unmute. You're mute. Still mute. Ah. Right, let me, let me start again. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, thank you, Ambassador. Can you put your volume down a little bit? Uh, dear uh, panelists uh, and dear viewers, uh, welcome to our webinar. We find ourselves in unprecedented situation. But even before this situation happened, there was, there was a lot of hype about the fourth industrial revolution. Everybody who had five minutes of time was talking about uh, the changes that are coming, how we don't know what will happen, how everything has to be done differently and so on. And then you all went back to doing things the way we've been doing them for decades and decades. We were uh, talking to our students about how the education has to change using the PowerPoint, Blackboard, Chalk and so on and so on. And it seems like the universe got uh, kind of impatient with us and it, it said, let me show you what the change looks like. And we got coronavirus. And now we are facing the situation that we never faced before. And this coronavirus was a real reality check. The things that we're talking about before, how everything will change and whatever, now it's happening. And this situation showed us that we are very, very ill prepared to deal with this kind of situations, that our systems are crumbling and that there are so many, many problems all around the world. But at the same time, this situation showed how interconnected we are, how anything that happens in one part of the world influences the whole world. So nobody can say, this is not my problem, this is your problem, you solve it. We are all connected and whatever happens to us influences you and vice versa. So this situation showed us that collaboration and evidence-based decision-making are the only solutions for this kind of uh, unprecedented crisis. So with this context of being aware how collaboration and evidence-based decision-making are important, we embarked upon a project where we want to apply these lessons to the issue of Bay of Bengal. So instead of doing it on our own, we said, let's do this in collaboration and let's together do the research that will provide this evidence so that decision makers can make informed decisions. Now there is a very esteemed institution called BIMRAN, Bangladesh Institute of Maritime Research and Development. This is the nation's first intellectual research institute that acts as a common platform to integrate and organize all maritime intellectuals, researchers and institutions for the sustainable use of the sea, to support blue economy initiatives of the government and to contribute towards the sustainable development of the country. So what better partner could we find when we want to address Bay of Bengal issues? Then there's the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD. This is one of the leading research and capacity building organizations working on climate change and development in Bangladesh and IUB is lucky enough to host this uh, center, so it is also part of our university. And last but not the least, IUB, Independent University of Bangladesh, 
established in 1993, is one of the top private universities in Bangladesh with an explicit focus on research and global partnerships. So these three institutions came together. We just recently signed an MOU with BIMRAT, and as I said, ICAD is part of IUB. So we will join our forces, we join our resources, and we will provide the research that will be the basis for policymakers to make informed decisions. And the first step in our cooperation is a series of these four webinars. And we're starting the first one today. And I'm really looking forward to hear the contributions of our esteemed participants. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for your uh, ins inspirational words and for setting the uh, tone for, the, for this conference. Uh, uh, I would like to now welcome our partner with whom we have signed our uh, agreement of collaboration only yesterday, uh, Admiral Nizam, former Chief of Naval Staff of Bangladesh, who is now the Chairman of the BIMRAT. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in the Bangladesh Navy and has served our nation admirably in defense of Bangladesh on the high seas and in a maritime realm. Admiral Rizam, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Ambassador Tariq Karim, distinguished panelists and participants. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum and very good morning to all of you. At the outset, I want to welcome all of you to today's webinar on the theme increasing political, ecological, economic, and regional importance of the Bay of Bengal for Bangladesh in the post-COVID-19 world. You have heard that yesterday, Bimrat, Bangladesh Institute of Maritime Research and Development, signed the MOU with IUB and ICAT. And these four, winner, these four webinars are jointly organized by them. I think they have done a commendable job. My heartiest congratulations and appreciations to all of them. Ladies and gentlemen, we all of us know more or less the importance of Bay of Bengal, which occupies an area of 1 million square miles. Historically, the Bay of Bengal has been a highway of transport, trade, and cultural exchange between diverse people encompassing South Asia and South East Asia. This bay hosts, hosts vital shipping routes linking its littoral and landlocked hinterland with the Indian Ocean. Bangladesh is a maritime nation having a vast area of exclusive economic zone. With the dynamic leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasida, we have solved our maritime disputes with Myanmar and India. We have now 1,18,813 square kilometer of our own sea area. With the depletion of land resources, we need to harness urgently our living and non-living resources. It is also necessary to conduct research and environmental experimentation at sea. At the same time, we need to strengthen our strength to protect our water from traditional and non-traditional threats. Distinguished guests, the Bay of Bengal physically connects the Pacific and Indian Ocean and is becoming a prime zone of a strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific. It is also the key connector between East and South Asia. So, Bay of Bengal is a strategic focus point for India, China, ASEAN countries, Japan, and others power who compete to dominate this region. As you can see, the Chinese Maritime Silk Road initiatives, commercial and infrastructure investment in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. India's initiative, initiative to build up the strategic island of Andaman and Nicobar 
India is also refocusing on the Bay of Bengal initiative through BIMSTEC. On the other hand, United States' interest in the Bay of Bengal have grown and evolved by Chinese first expansion in the region, maybe named as US rebalancing strategy. So Bangladesh can play a vital role in cashing these new strategic opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 outbreak was triggered in Hubei province of China and it spread it across the whole world. We lost a lot of human lives, Global supply chain has been disrupted. The pandemic is still not. We lost a lot of human lives. Global supply chain has been disrupted. The pandemic is still not over. What sort of global and regional scenario will arise post COVID-19 is uncertain and we do not know. These four webinars are designed to look all these issues and I hope very brilliant recommendations will come out from discussion. Before I conclude, I humbly pay my deepest tribute to the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who enacted Territorial Waters and Maritime Zone Act 1974, much before the promulgation of UNCLOS III in 1982. I express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your presence in this webinar, webinar today, despite your busy schedules. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Admiral Nizam, for your uh, very valuable and inspiring comments. Uh, we look forward to the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the IUB, Mr. A. Mateen Chaudhary. He is uh, a dynamic guiding force of the IUB in shaping its, its programs of the IUB, Mr. A. Mateen Chaudhary. He is a, a dynamic guiding force of the IUB in shaping its, its programs, educational and research programs. And he has taken keen interest. I thank him for his interest in this, in this uh, uh, activity of ours. I invite him now to the floor. Mr. Chaudhary, sir, you the, the Floor is yours. Thank you for your kind words. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, it is a rare occasion that we see so many luminaries coming from so different and diverse places in IUB. We now have our own faculty. We have uh, the Bangladesh Naval Chief, former Naval Chief with us. We have the Foreign Secretary. We have eminent uh, research scholar, Mr. Fizur Rahman. We have the Ambassador. Uh, Shahidul Islam, then we have the ambassador from Japan, and I, of course, Salim Mulhak is part of us, and uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing Mr. Gohar Rizvi on whenever he joins. So this is the first step of uh, what I call interdisciplinary in action, interaction. Bangladesh, we have been here for about 50 years, and we've gone through various phases. We have done a lot of work. Everyone has done different work. Private education was introduced about 30, 35 years ago, and 30 years ago, basically, and we have been the pioneer. In this 30 years, we've walked alone and we've come thus far. But walking alone doesn't take us very far. We have done what we wanted to, but our new goals can only come in if we work collectively. So it's great to see that Mustafiz is here from uh, uh, Anyways, my memories go bad. So, you know, uh, Mustafiz is here, then the BIMSTEC uh, uh, Secretariat is here, the Foreign Ministry is here, Japanese government is here, the Navy is here. So this is which this is what we are, which we have been waiting for and is starting off. So this is a very, very bold, just uh, bold initiative that has been taken by ICAD, BIMRAT and IUB to form this associate union. Now, coming back from my experience, it's never easy to work with strangers or stay, work with different people. So all three of us will have problems. And the easiest point would be to blame each other and just kill this project. My advice to all of you would be, please take it as a long-term thought. Don't jump 
with a problem. Don't jump with others. Problems will come on the way. We will all find each other unreasonable, but we need to work together and communicate and talk and make this a success. So as a chairman of IUB, I commit that IUB will stick to this project. And I'm sure uh, Admiral Nizam, your institution, Bimrad, will also come with us and carry it through and Salimul Haq. So together we will make sure that this alliance, which we have inked yesterday, will be something that is going to last and going to bring benefit. And all of you who are supporting us, uh, the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Fizur Rahman, Mr. Ambassador Shahidul Islam, and the Japanese Ambassador, we are looking for you to come along and support us because this work that we are trying to embark upon not be achieved by us alone. I just go back, you know, this country, we've seen it for the last, uh, since liberation, we've come through a lot of hurdles and we've overcome many of them. The, the last problem which we are now overcoming is the pandemic. And I personally feel that I being in the industry as well as with involved with education and health and other things, we are handling it with all our resource constraint, corruption, in, uh, inefficiencies still well. The only thing was that people came together. The government has come up with good programs, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's program on economic health and uh, poverty, uh, you know, aid to poor people, etc., worked out extremely well in connection with the private sector because then we went in and supplemented those. So that was the foundation and we supplemented. Therefore, we can proudly say nobody died of hunger during this whole pandemic. On the industry, the government has put in a few programs of support, which were very well crafted, which has made sure that there is no corruption, like the salary support which was given, the salaries went straight to the employees. So there was no, no way that there could be corruption. So that way, we, I find that this is a very big uh, initiative, a very big success of Bangladesh, of public and private working together. So it's now the time for us to work together. If we take the models of developed countries, no country is developed with governmental support. Countries develop with everybody's support. So that is, uh, that is why I'm so happy. When, when this alliance has been formed yesterday, and it is a lesson. Is there something wrong or am I here? No, please yeah. continue. May I request this everybody to use their yes. mics until they uh, are ready to speak? Please continue, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, this came out yesterday, the ICAD, IUB, and BIMRAD. And in that first meeting, ICAD has proposed that Gobishna 2021 will have a session, will have a day or a topic on what we are doing together. So, the, so there we are, that when we see, when we put our hands together, we see new opportunities coming out. So Gobeshana will be strengthened by this project. Bimrad will be, have an opportunity to really go global with this uh, Gobeshana, which is a famous and a well-established global program, I would say, not only Bangladeshi. So that is where I see benefits can come. So we, my advice to everybody would be, please hold on and be patient. There will be frustration, but don't give it up. From IUB side, we have a huge faculty and a lot of students. Now, anything that we do, at least uh, I personally uh, say this, and I'm sure all of you will agree, anything that we do is for tomorrow. Is that for the children who are going to take up leadership tomorrow? So if Bimbra wants a good people to work with them, groom them to the university. We have to teach them to the university. So students are really our main asset. And this is this human capital is something that we need to work on. And Bimrad actually gets a huge opportunity by having this pool of students available for supporting them. So I don't want to further strengthen my discussions, but I would again advise everybody to make sure that we are all very uh, committed to this and we move forward. And I'm sure this will bring in good results. Thank you for the office. Thank you, Chairman, uh, uh, for spelling out your vision of IUB's goal and how IUB can actually help in 
nation building and nation development and uh, help Bangladesh to go forward. As you correctly mentioned, this is something which is long term. The journey of a thousand miles always begins with the first step. And a good idea never dies. It's important that people pick on the good idea and keep plugging away at it. And nothing in this part of the region happens overnight. But if we keep engaged, we will keep going forward, God willing. Uh, our chief guest, Professor Gohar Rizvi, will be joining us a little late. He actually committed himself wholeheartedly to this. Uh, uh, and then he had to leave for London. He was supposed to be back in early September. He said, definitely, I'll be back by before the webinar. But life intervenes. So he apologized that he'll be a little late, uh, but he will join us around 12. So we will bring him in when he comes and joins us at that time. I'll now straightforward go to uh, our keynote speaker. The keynote speaker is our foreign secretary, uh, a distinguished colleague of mine, uh, with whom I've had the pleasure of serving from across the world and across oceans. He was our ambassador to Japan and our, uh, uh, um, immediately prior to taking up the present assignment, he was our permanent representative to New York. Uh, apart from other senior appointments, he has served in different stations. He's had a very distinguished career and is a thinker at the same time for which I admire him. So Foreign Secretary, the screen is yours. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Tariq Korea. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Milan Tagon, uh, Vice Chancellor and Chairman, uh, Mr. Mutin Chaudhary, Independent University of Bangladesh. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, panelists, and ladies and gentlemen. Greetings and a very good uh, morning to you all from uh, Ankara. In uh, Mujib Borsho, we just inaugurated the Chancery Complex in Ankara, commemorating the birth centenary of the father of the nation, Bangalore Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. At the outset, let me thank the university and in particular, uh, Vice Chancellor Kagan and my esteemed senior colleague, Ambassador Tariq Kurim for uh, organizing the webinar series, uh, increasing political, ecological, economic, and regional importance of the Bay of Bengal for Bangladesh in the post-COVID-19 world. I'm delighted to be invited uh, to deliver the keynote speech at this uh, inception webinar the first of four in the series in which the distinguished panel uh, is invited to discuss on the likely uh, geopolitical, geostrategic, and geoeconomic scenario in the Bay of Bengal region in the post-COVID-19 world, implications for uh, and Bangladesh's response to the challenges. This is indeed a very uh, vast yet uh, timely topic, and, and I uh, thank uh, the organizers for choosing such a topic. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all aspects of our lives and has forced us to rethink and realign our routines and priorities. Just about every human being on the planet has been affected either by the virus itself or by its social and economic consequences. The pandemic has also unraveled the apparently solid edifice of global supply and value chains, industrial networks, mass production, timely deliveries of Produces to markets, etc. While the viral infection appeared as an equal threat to all, its socioeconomic impacts are far from being equal. Because of the deep rooted structural vulnerability, developing countries are being most adversely affected by the pandemic, and for many, it may reverse decade long development gains. But most importantly, it has posed serious questions about our common future that is the post-COVID era. What could be the structure of this post-COVID world and how could we make the best out of that? In the last few decades, the world has accumulated unprecedented affluence due to globalization. World has embraced global supply chains, giving rise to a tangled wave of production networks that dovetailed our economies. Any complex product is now being made in several countries each supplying its own specialized component. However, this drive towards specialization also made substitution difficult. And as production went global, countries also became 
more independent and vulnerable. Some economic sectors, particularly those with a high degree of redundancy, could weather the crisis relatively well. At the same time, many others may collapse if the pandemic ends up preventing a single supplier in a single country from producing a critical and widely used component. Even if production is not affected in any of the countries, supply chain may suffer when governments give in to their worst instincts. At the beginning of the pandemic, prohibition of exports of medical masks and respirators is an example of how governments with the health and safety of their citizens at stake may decide to block exports or seize critical supplies, even if such actions hurt their allies and neighbors. Thus, retreat from globalization remains a serious possibility in the post-COVID world. This would certainly bring changes in global geopolitics and long-held alignments. Bay of Bengal and countries connected to the Bay certainly not, will not remain insulated from that probable geopolitical shift. In recent years, geostrategic importance of Bay of Bengal has increased many folds. Bay of Bengal connects the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. It is the largest bay in the world. It connects South Asia to the Southeast Asia. The bay carries great significance at civilizational, ecological, economic, and political levels in the region. The rise of China and India to the status of major powers have completely recalibrated the importance of the Indo-Pacific to the world. Bay of Bengal is a major part of the Indian Ocean region, as well as being the connector of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, will have a significant effect in shaping the regional strategic landscape. The region encompasses the Maldives, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and in the hinterlands, Bhutan and Nepal, and may I say, from all possible angles, China. The densely populated Bay of Bengal with a combined GDP of US dollar 2.8 trillion managed an average annual growth rate between 3.4 and 7.5% for the past decade. Bay of Bengal has a rich story to tell. This is one of the rare seas of the world, not unlike the Mediterranean and the Gulf, which has seen cross streams of civilization. Indeed, this is one of those seas where both the Indian and the Chinese civilizations, and then the Arab and later each of the European maritime powers have tried to dominate the strategic space. So long as the intermesh between our national priorities and our international or transnational engagements are concerned, Bay of Bengal is not just another sea. It is a living and breathing ecosystem of life forms, commercial and diplomatic efforts, individuals, businesses, and corporate interests, evolutionary tendencies of societies, nations, countries, especially those with a Westminster-style democracy and those with a more regimented set of governance structures, and how each tries to influence and entice the other, and above all, of Mother Nature, with all her furies and fiery beauties. In other words, a harmony amongst often conflicting priorities of economy, ecology, and security. The lenses, layers, and spheres through which the Bay of Bengal could be seen are many and multifarious. Coupled with our own initiatives, such as the SARC, BIMSTEC, BBIN processes, where the Bay of Bengal holds a very prominent position, we also have two overlapping strategic constructs crossing their pathways across the cone of the Bay of Bengal, namely the Indo-Pacific strategy and the Belt and Road Initiative. At a different layer, the spectrum of instability, possibly anarchy, also emanates from a complex wave of factors like historical antagonism across states and communities, undefined land and maritime boundaries, cross-border affiliation of ethno-linguistic and religious groups, conflicts of economic interests, reluctance of parties to share common river basins and natural resources, and an often turbulent process of nation building, either too dominated by pre-Westphalian community-driven status quo and a strong concoction of regional as well as extra-regional factors. At the end of 2020, what we see now is the re-emergence of a civilizational competition for dominance across all avenues of knowledge, technology, trade, finance, economy, and security. 
which might directly impact the Bay of Bengal. With decades of backbreaking preparation and build up in the South China Sea, the critical fleet parity between the Chinese and the Western and Western allied South and South Asian nations is evolving fast. On the other hand, as for its economy, China is first heading towards a plateauing of its productive capabilities in certain segments, such as labor intensive manufacturing and traditional consumer goods, while at the same time, the economy is also fast concentrating towards indigenization of advanced core technologies adopted or acquired extraterritorially and augmentation of core computing facilities leading possibility, possibly to an advanced AI dominated scenario. The first to challenge the Western sea power in the greater Indian Ocean region was China. From Chinese government sources, it appears that the Belt and Road Initiative has been devised to render a new level of opportunity for countries involved in and beyond. China believes, as far as its official statements are concerned, that it is possible to engage in any cooperation through three basic synergies, that is, between domestic policies, between development objectives, and between cooperation matrices. Since 2016, the Chinese BRI initiative is now in check by the US-led Indo-Pacific strategy with four pillars, freedom of navigation, overflight, and flow of commerce, the peaceful resolution of territorial dispute in accordance with the international law, C, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, D, transparency in infrastructure development and responsible debt financing. These principles were adopted and reinforced in the National Security Strategy released in November 2017. In the National Security Strategy, the Indo-Pacific issue has been placed in the regional context and topped all other regional issues, giving it a very special importance. Pacific Command is now Indo-Pacific Command. Additionally, the Japanese formulations in matters relating to the evolving strategic game in the Indo-Pacific is trying to make deep inroads through FOIP, which includes a promotion and establishment of the rule of law, freedom of navigation, free trade, etc. B, maintain fundamental principles and values of international order, which is the foundation of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And C, commitment for peace and stability. With such specific objectives in sight from all sides, we see important manifestations already taking place across all of the above areas. Seen from a distance, the Middle East and Europe still remain fringe strategic options for the gaming in South and East Asia. Relatively inoculated, these geographic identities play host to niches and bubbles which affect only a certain segment of the societies which define the strategic imperative of the three countries in question. And in particular, so long as Bangladesh's strategic outreach is concerned, but these are also important considerations as we devise our ways into the future with the Bay at the center. With some of the world's largest reserves of gas and other seabed minerals and possibly rare earth minerals, the Bay is rich in untapped natural resources. Linking the Indian and the Pacific Oceans, the Bay occupies a central position in relation to global economic flows in a way that few other regions do. It is a strategic funnel to the Malacca Straits and the Lombok Strait, and thus it has grown in strategic importance for China, Japan, India, and ultimately the US and its allied powers. It is through this region that half of the world's container traffic passes, and its ports handle approximately 30% of the world trade. The traffic on the seas has increased by 470% since 1970 and is likely to triple in the next 20 years. With 66% of oil shipments, so vital for India, Japan, and China, and 33% of the world's bulk cargo passing through these waters, the bay is practically on the economic highway of the world. The bay's global significance is further accentuated as one of the largest fishing grounds of the world, with a proven stock of approximately 15% of world's total fish catch, about 9 million tons per annum. The rich treasures of the bay is also associated with transnational threats like the trafficking of narcotics, psychotropic drugs, weapons and people, illegal exploitation of natural resources, undemarcated borders and border disputes, refugees and internationally displaced humans, 
insurgencies and terrorist groups, and increasingly natural disasters and adverse changes in the climate change, which disrupt national, regional, and ultimately global stability. Remember, with only a meter rise in the sea level, there will be a displacement of 20 million people inside Bangladesh alone. Additionally, while merchant shipping is being increasingly recognized as a core component in national economic planning, transportation of about 60% of world crude oil and its products along the oil tanker routes of the Bay of Bengal has rendered it prone to oil and blast pollution. Oil spills can occur anywhere at the sea and the catastrophe does not respect national boundaries and plastic pollution is as bad as the rest of the seas of the world. For Bangladesh, we have Vision 2041 and the Delta Plan 20, uh, 2100 set in motion. The single most vital avenue for such a massive undertaking is the blue economy. Bangladesh has been co-sponsoring the Zone of Peace Resolution for the Bay of Bengal for decades now. We have resolved our maritime discontents through the use of unclosed and arbitration. We have an abundantly young, upwardly mobile and extremely nimble youth population. While we always appreciate and reinforce our faith in a rule-based, value-based international order, we have to choose our own destiny with knowledge, with skills, and more than everything else, with courage and with conviction. Our priorities from the Bay must include, number one, funds, both for project financing and substantive investment. Two, technology, both for upgrading the existing industry, such as in the jute, viscose sector, fishing, etc., and also for creating advanced architectures in technology-oriented economic activities such as ICT, particularly IC chip, transistor fabrication, deep sea fishing and resources, harvesting, agriculture and farming. Three, management skills for efficiency in international operations. Four, market access and brand equity for securing higher premiums and assured ascending returns from existing and conceived business verticals. Five, capabilities to build on existing platforms in defense, in agriculture, in industry, in communication, in water resources, primarily river training and flood management and in blue economy. It is perhaps safe to predict that the coming era will be one of major health crises, climate shocks, techno rivalries, geo-economic, geostrategic and geopolitical competitions among the great powers. For Bangladesh, all these will have direct and indirect impacts. For decades, under the visionary leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we have been trying to build a resilient Bangladesh. Resilience is what enables us to endure challenging situations and emerge stronger and better. Resilience is our ability to resist, recover, and adapt to shocks and disasters. To be flexible and adaptable so that we can withstand unforeseen impacts such as COVID pandemic. To locate our strategic advantages for navigating geostrategic imperatives. To build the foundation of our national resilience, we followed the foreign policy dictum propounded by the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, friendship to all, malice towards none. We believe no country on its own can be resilient enough. Not all critical supplies and manufacturing capacities will be available domestically, and no single country controls the entire supply chains needed to respond to an unforeseen emergency like COVID-19. The solution is therefore to deepen ties and build alliances that bind the countries with common interest, shared geography, history, and culture. The Bay of Bengal is our common strategic interlocutor for building such alliance. Under a common and shared narrative, it is time for us to further strengthen the Bay of Bengal Alliance among the littoral countries to maximize geopolitical, geostrategic, and geoeconomic benefits for all. Before I conclude, I would like to invite all to think about the following seven themes related to the Bay of Bengal. And coincidentally, all of them begins with what, uh, the letter F. First, fleet. Alongside creating an information and security network staked by all major powers, could we create a fleet of deep sea fishing and shipping vessels and develop coastal areas for setting up processing plants. Two, fabrication. 
Could we explore the possibility of attracting major economic players of the world to set up manufacturing and containerization facilities inside Bangladesh territory for exporting directly from Bangladesh to either the world market or at least the home markets? Three, freeway. Could we explore the possibility of centrally taking over all the major riverbank systems and create environment-friendly industrial ecosystems, preserving the navigability, shore protection, and ecological sustenance for the rivers, and also for connecting the seas? What if we involve our neighbors in the project? Four, fireflies. The fourth area where significant focus could be given is to have smart power corridors across the Bay of Bengal, connecting the GBM, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Magna Basin, and the Mekong Delta. Could we think about it? Five, finance. Fifth is the creation of a blockchain-enabled platform economy system, which can enable ecosystem asset mobilization and payments to seamlessly integrate strategic priorities into human and economic development. Six, fusion. Could we think of connecting the P2P potential of the Bay of Bengal and promote it as a safe space for civilizational dialogues as opposed to a place for confrontations. And lastly, seven, future. We need to consider the skills needed for survival and growth in the next decade and beyond. The Bay could be our proving grounds. Could we think of a way to engage the youth from around the Bay and see how they are poised to take up the challenge? I thank you. All. Thank you, Foreign Secretary, uh, for your amazingly in-depth and broad vision speech, which has given us a lot of food for thought and indeed sets the tone for our future discussions, not only in the coming forthcoming seminars, but as and when IUB also sets up a Center for Bay of Bengal Studies in-depth studies on specific areas. Uh, you have rightly pointed out that we live in an interconnected world. It's uh, where competing narratives come and meet, intersect in the Bay of Bengal. You have pointed out the, the extreme strategic importance that the Bay has acquired in recent decades. Uh, not only because of it, it is the shipping, uh, a main shipping highway for many of the raw, raw materials and resources that all over the world is required from east to west. It is also a treasure trove of uh, marine life and mineral resources still vastly unexplored. Uh, and, and you've mentioned the five priorities of Bangladesh. Uh, and, and, of course, everything has to be geared towards addressing these five priorities. But importantly, you have mentioned the point of developing resilience in the national uh, era. Uh, and I would see this not just, as you mentioned also, it's not just national resilience, we need to develop also the regional resilience. That is what the COVID-19 crisis actually has made us aware of. We are no longer islands living by ourselves. We are uh, interconnected. Uh, you know, and, and I recall uh, as a student of literature, John Donne's famous uh, words, no man is, is an island. Every man is a piece of the continent. And if you hear the bell tolling and call, ask, who is the bell tolling for? Right now, it is tolling for all of us. So this is something we need to keep in mind, that we will survive as humanity if we work, we understand that humanity is one. And I think the place to start is radiating out from the concentric inner circle of the nation to the regional uh, development of togetherness and ra gradually radiating out to include larger and larger regions beyond. Thank you very much indeed for your invaluable comments and, and we shall take note of particularly the seven F's that you mentioned. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I can understand now why in your career you have come to become foreign secretary today. 
uh, they, we are indeed fortunate to have you. Um, let me move, move on now to our two panelists. We have two very distinguished panelists, one in-house and one an external, both professors. Uh, in deference to our guest, I will invite Professor Mustafizur Rahman, who's a very distinguished economist, a distinguished fellow at the Center for Policy Development. We have known each other for long. We have worked in the trenches together, trying to promote the idea of regional cooperation and collaboration. He's a champion of regional cooperation. Uh, and I invite him to come and, and share his ideas. Professor Mustafizur Rahman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Tariq Karim, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Milan Pagan, uh, Admiral Nizamuddin Ahmed, uh, Mr. Emotin Choudhury, Chairman BOT uh, of IUB, one of my very favorite uh, persons. Uh, keynote speaker, Honorable uh, Foreign Secretary, Mr. Masood bin Momen. Honorable special guests, uh, be Mr. Secretary General, His Excellency Shoydin Islam and Ambassador, His Excellency Ito Naoki. Uh, dear uh, audience uh, and, and my, my very eminent fellow uh, panelist, um, Professor Imtiaz. Uh, first of all, let me register my deep appreciation for this uh, uh, invitation to be on this uh, panel. I would like to congratulate IUB, uh, BIMRAD, and ICAD to have got together uh, in a multidisciplinary effort uh, to, uh, to discuss and debate the issues which are of so importance, uh, uh, high importance uh, as we move forward uh, in, the, uh, in the current uh, dispensation and also uh, post-COVID uh, era. Uh, I think that uh, that as as uh, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Milan Pagan has said that we need evidence based uh, data and information uh, so that our policymakers can can uh, can can take the right decisions uh, to take forward uh, our uh, our country in the 21st century. And the uh, uh, brilliant in his brilliant speech, uh, our Honorable Foreign Secretary has mentioned. And, and gave, gave us some direction uh, where, where we should go. Now, uh, taking cue from Uh, the first issue is that we have to, as, as they say, uh, build back better. Build back better means that as we go forward in the post-COVID uh, world, we in, 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 in the current pandemic period, and also we have to build better in the sense that it has to be now environmentally more sustainable future. So I think that this is very, very important because uh, one of the reasons why we are experiencing this pandemic is also connected with the way that we have treated with nature, we have treated with environment. So I think that it is very important that, that we, we really mean when we say that we will build back better. So it has to be an environmentally sustainable future. Now, the second point is that I would like to distinguish between regionalism and regionalization. Now, as the uh, 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 Foreign Secretary has rightly mentioned, countries are becoming uh, you know, closer uh, and we are interacting more. So it is a world of cooperation and collaboration. But at the same time, it is also a world of competition and contestation. And, and, and we will have to find you know, ways. It, it may, should not be a zero-sum game. 
but 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 we will have to find the win-win solutions in going forward and there i think that when we say regionalization it means that in the bay of bengal area we are trading more uh, because countries are opening up trade is opening up we are having various connectivities so that's the natural process but by regionalism i mean a conscious effort to take it forward so for example bangladesh is now passing through you know a very challenging time we are passing through dual graduation the middle income graduation and and also the incoming ldc graduation and the way that we do business will be changing the market access will not be there the cost of borrowings will go up because of the middle income graduation so how do you deepen uh, the gohar bhai slan Uh, how do we deepen uh, the, the 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 connectivity so so i say that we will have to deepen and i take you from what the honorable foreign secretary has said is deepening trade connectivity investment connectivity you know transport connectivity logistics connectivity people to people connectivity and as he said very rightly i add the sixth one the financial connectivity i think that this is where the distinction between regionalization a, a a natural process of closer cooperation and regionalism a conscious effort to deepen cooperation so that comes and that brings me to my third point which uh, ambassador uh, admiral Niz- nizamuddin ahmed very rightly mentioned that we now have 118000 square kilometer in the bay of bengal so we should not say that bangladesh territory i think this is my formulation that we should not no more say that bangladesh territory is 144000 square kilometer we should say that our territory is 262000 square kilometer and that's how we should look at the bay of bengal the next frontier the blue economy and there i will bring also the foreign secretary has very rightly mentioned the the the, the resources the fisheries resources so i think that diplomacy is also very important in this connection because for example in the wto we are now negotiating the fisheries agreement there are a lot of you know provisions which will be added into the agreement with regard to subsidies etc etc how do we as as a least developed country as a low income country we safeguard our interest i think that is also also very important so active participation in 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 global negotiations that matter so that they do not impede our exploration and exploitation of the resources in the bay of bengal so i think that that uh, that synthesis of interest uh, local regional and global uh, has to be there um, the other point is that in the context of uh, 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 deepening uh, our regional cooperation and and since be mistake is, is 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 very important as as a as 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 uh, our speakers have also mentioned so i think that we have to also at one point of time think beyond be mistake we are now seeing that you know rcep is coming up it will be you know regional comprehensive economic partnership one of the largest regional groupings in the world and it's now 15 countries perhaps india will also join so how do we also get into uh, rcep as as a partner perhaps so i think that that will also be a strategic um, vision point uh, that we will have to think about bangladesh is one of the very few low income countries which doesn't have bilateral agreements but once we graduate bilateral agreements will give us the market access that we will lose because of ldc graduation so we are only starting to do that we are having our pta with uh, with bhutan Uh, but that's I, i i take it as as just a test case but we will have to have bilateral agreements with with larger countries uh, more comprehensive agreement just not pta or free trade agreement fta i think comprehensive economic partnership agreements where we can have all those connectivities get to, got together so that type of uh, uh, i think initiative and and negotiating power we will have to um, uh, garner and from that perspective yes uh, bhutan may be a start but what i am telling is that our negotiating strategies negotiating capacity will have to be enhanced many fold 
if we really want to um, take advantage of, uh, of, of cooperation in the Bay of Bengal. And the last point is that, as, uh, as the Foreign Secretary has also mentioned, many of the countries have pursued uh, during the COVID period protectionist policies. Uh, we haven't seen uh, a ban on export of food items uh, as we have seen in 2007-8, but there are protectionist measures with regard to food items, with regard to uh, medical equipments. So I think that there has to be a global understanding also that these type of protectionist policies will not be pursued, at least in the context of low income countries and, and, and the LDCs. But we are seeing that it is still going on. So, 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 so that global understanding as we build back better has also to be there. Uh, and, 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 and G20 can play a very important role you know, in, in that context. China and, and India, I think that I was in 1999 in, in, in Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew was giving a lecture and he was telling that in the 21st century, Singapore will be flying on two wings, India and China. And I was thinking that Bangladesh should be telling that we will be flying on the 20, in the 21st century on two wings, China and, and, and India. And, and they are now importing, major importers. India is importing about $500 billion worth of goods. China is importing $2,200 billion worth of goods. But what is our export? It's less than $2 billion. It is less than one-tenth of 1%. One but at CPD, we were doing some research and we found out very interestingly that they are importing many products which we are exporting, but not to those countries. So where are the bottlenecks? And they are, I think, that now the initiatives that this government is, is taking, multimodal connectivity, um, more uh, trade facilitation, single windows, paperless trade, I think that those could be brought together so that we can translate our competitive advantages into competitive advantages and get into those major importing countries. We shouldn't just say that non-tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers. Many of those non-tariff barriers are really trade facilitation barriers. And, and, and the current uh, initiatives that we are taking, I think that they can play a very important role. So finally, I would like to once again congratulate uh, IUB for uh, getting uh, this together and, and for the collaboration that they are envisaging. And as Motin Bhai has very rightly mentioned, uh, I, we also hope that this will be a successful endeavor. And as independent uh, think tanks, uh, our support and, and cooperation and collaboration will always be there as you go forward. Thank you, Ambassador Karim. Thank you very much, Professor Mustafiz. Uh, I, I... You have so succinctly summarized everything into five points, and uh, I will come back to them when I do the summing up. I think brilliantly put in there. Uh, you know, the, particularly the point that you have last point number, you know, five, uh, where Bangladesh actually can play a bridging role. The foreign secretary also alluded to that. We are where India and Chinese interests come and meet. We are where the Indo-Pacific and BRI narratives come and meet. We can facilitate a common neutral space for these two presently competing strategies to come and play with each other. And, and this is in fact our father of the nation in his own visionary address to the uh, UN General Assembly, the first one by Bangladesh leader at the UN Assembly after we became members, he mentioned this specifically, that we, our friendship for all is not just a catchword taken from Lincoln. It's in its essence, it is what will enable us to survive. It is what will enable us to build. And I think we have admirably, certainly under the dynamic leadership of uh, his daughter, who inherited his mantle, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we have adhered to that policy, that we will build friendship with all and enable all, even if they are competing or contesting with each other, to come and meet here and over cups of tea, numerous cups of tea and coffee, and find solutions. I take this opportunity, first of all, before I go on, to welcome my dear friend, Professor Gohar Rizvi, uh, old comrade, 
very respected partner. He, when I was in the trenches, uh, uh, trying to build bilateral relationship with India, he was my anchor. Without him, we could not have done many things. And in, in fact, as a champion of regional cooperation, I've always looked to him for inspiration. Now, uh, I will give him the option of whether he would like to speak now or wait until he has heard the other two, uh, uh, three speakers we have and come in with the last word and summing up. Professor Rizmi, what is your choice? Tarek Bhai, thank you uh, very, very much for your welcoming words. I intend to stay uh, uh, for the seminar a little longer. Okay. Uh, how, uh, however, that said, if I could be brought in, in in the next half an hour, I'll be very grateful. Excellent. I'll bring you in with the last word. It'll be certainly before the half hour concludes. Uh, okay. So please do listen to the others. We're very happy. And uh, we'll fill you in on what the Foreign Secretary and others said. It was a brilliant speech. And I think you'll be proud that we have him as Foreign Secretary. Uh, I'll request Professor uh, Imtiaz Hussain, our own in-house expert. Or he's the Dean of Global Studies and Governance uh, in, in the IUB. Uh, and uh, uh, he's the head of the Global Studies and Governance and Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and uh, uh, Social Science. And Imtiaz, uh, many, many, many uh, uh, under his belt, to his credit. Professor um, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, Excellencies, distinguished guests, um, my peers and um, colleagues, both inside the university and outside. Um, and I would like to basically resonate with a lot of what our foreign secretary has mentioned, supported by my fellow panelists, uh, my Mustafa is I. Uh, the basic question I am using is uh, simply, uh, can an automated Bangladesh find a platform in South Asia? This is based upon three uh, propositions. One, Bangladesh is that uh, we will be a developed country by the 2040s. That requires the second one. And we transit our low wage workers by then. And this one is the third one is the pandemic. It has opened a huge uh, automated um, uh, window that we must climb to be able to answer that question. And I approach it in three ways. Um, I approach it uh, by going, this is the outline of my six direct pandemic threats, and then the five on the right hand side, the five indirect pandemic threats, and then the five similar threats in between. From those, I will bring out some policy making uh, picture, which is based upon the traditional global. Um, vicious cycle as it is becoming now under, under automation and pandemic between policy demand and supply and propose a kind of a virtuous cycle to end that. And then I will illustrate these to the famous parable of the elephant and the six blind men before I draw conclusions of which there are three and then there will be uh, four um, uh, um, implications drawn from them. Let me turn first to the direct economic effects. First one, certainly trade has shrunk. Our own by exports have shrunk from 17%, imports by 9%. Investment has also collapsed in April, 85% of our R&D had to close down. So it was difficult to start the machine like that. And then the industrial collapse, for example, when you have social distancing entering factories, it is also going to be imposing a huge direct burden upon the producer and the consumer. The fourth one, remittances. So far, we've had something like 29% cutback. Last year, we earned 18 billion. And if you have one third of that almost gone, it's going to be a tough, tough, tough season. 
And then we look at the fifth one, which is the stimulus spending. And here, up until June, we have spent 3.7% of our GDP, about just a little over 11 billion US dollars. And so this is all going to impact the sixth impact, which is the, the sixth effect, and that is the growth rate. For a country and probably only one on this planet, for 35 years, it had growth rate of five plus, mostly six plus every year. Suddenly we are going to have to shrink to 2.3 and that's the most optimistic picture more likely one to 2% uh, um, kind of a growth rate. And these are based on figures of the World Bank and the OECD. Let me turn to the indirect economic effects. Economic, every time I drive up the airport road for the first three months of the pandemic, I will see the Dhaka Metro construction completely stop. So economically then we are, have construction kind of collapsing. And with that, lots of jobs will be also drying up. When we then combine it with the bailouts, the bailouts are basically helping consumers, consumption, not production. It is also diluting investment. And therefore we have another major problem on that front. The third one would be the regional agreements. And these have to take a second seat back see what's happening to the national economy just about everywhere. And then finally, among all of these, we will see a spike as we are watching in the Mediterranean, spike in illegal flows, both migrants and with that uh, drugs. And finally, we have a global setting which is growing increasingly um, um, domestic nationalistic closure. So against that background, I turn to the policymakers. And here it is becoming a damned if I do, damned if I don't kind of a dilemma. These are all traditional, so no one country is on the spot, but it has been a very, uh, uh, in retrospect, a very uh, vicious circle. Policymakers are built upon ministries and ministries look at single specific issues when we need them to look at many issues at the same time because of the second factor. Policy or any problems that we have, have multiple dimensions now. If we look at the Bay, for example, there are ecological problems, economic issues, security issues, multiple dimensions for which we need to really open up. And these create the third one, which is a market failure, mostly from lack of information. We cannot have information of all the facets at the same time. And therefore all of these add up and just worsen the situation. One way out of it would be to go to a virtuous circle. Here we confront the challenges all of you have presented. We need to rebuild trade and we need to do that locally. If we strengthen our national economy and the regional, then go global, it might help us a lot more. We might just have to do it whether we like it or not. Low wage is evaporating. How do we absorb all the people? Do we have the social policy, social security and so forth? That also enters the picture. A lot of migrants are coming back, 200,000, and that figure is rapidly increasing. How do we absorb them? They're coming back with more skills and money than they left. How do we can employ them more productively? And then we have to make uh, agreements, but these have to be on a bilateral basis. They have to be based on comparative advantage. The problem about the Bay of Bengal is that every country is selling um, garments. We have to have complementarities instead of competitive economies. And therefore, I want to show you the, the, the parable from uh, way back when, 4,000 years ago, um, the, the leg was seen as a tree by the blind person, all well intentioned, the tail was seen as a, you know, uh, the rope, the body as the wall, and so forth. And just like that, what we need to do today to policymakers, and they know it, is that we have to open their eyes. 
put vision into the picture. So we see the larger picture. And from all of that, let me just go to my concluding remarks. And these have also been uh, alluded to in the previous um, commentators. Um, the first thing is because of the segmented policy making, we need to have a more comprehensive. Many ministries will have to be put together and bring about a more um, joint comprehensive uh, policy response. POB, that's the Bay of Bengal dynamics must become multi-dimensional and policy linkages must be made as such. And the third one amplifies that. We need to broaden the boundaries of the Bay of Bengal. It cannot just be the land boundaries uh, around the Bay. We need to do what Instec and the Bay of Bengal, a large marine ecology ecosystem is doing, have more eco kind of boundaries so that even Thailand is a member of those two. And we need to extend it just from the South Asian countries. The, the, the implications here would be comparative advantage has to be absolutely the, the, the founding uh, stone, the pillar of this whole thing. Free trade agreements, yes, we are working on with Bhutan. We need a lot more. I know there are lots of negotiations going on. We need to amplify those and fit in high tech so that we are exporting something the other country does not have and importing what we don't have. And we need to open spaces where we don't have everything. That is the whole idea of comparative advantage and um, complementarity. The free trade agreement has to become the pillar of that comprehensive policy planning. And all of these have to be environmentally so, so sensitive because we are at the verge of collapse, not only climate change, but there are also pollution and lots of other problems that we really need to address. And then all of these must be the central pillar of anything global that Bangladesh should be looking at. Hopefully other Bay uh, littoral countries will be looking for. Settle the local problems, then go regionally and then globally. Home is where the heart lies and under our pillow is where we keep traditionally our purse. Once we look at that first and then build next door neighbor, all around and then eventually the globe will come to us for the markets we have created. Thank you so much and thank you Ambassador Tarek. Thank you very much Charles, uh, innovative approach and, and your catchy title for the talk, Big Blindman and Elephant Size. Uh, you brought up how we are all blind men moving around trying to define the shape of the answer and nature of the beast that stands there. Uh, the truth is never unidimensional, the truth is always multi dimensional. And it's only can't hear you. You've gone mute. You've gone mute. Ambassador Karim, you've gone mute. Mute. We can't hear you. Please unmute. Go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Imtiaz, for your very innovative and uh, uh, Imagine imagination capturing way of putting the, the problem of look, that we need to look at things holistically. Uh, the bay, the blind men, and the elephant size enigma, I think, uh, encapsulates the essence of what we are trying to deal with. Uh, we are all, in a sense, we have been blind men trying to figure out the size of the creature before us. And each has been saying, this is it, this is it. Actually, unless we are able to look at holistically at it, we will never be able to fathom the nature of the beast. And, and only if we can do that holistically. So, you know, your, your concept of 
concentric circles of engagement and collaboration is the need of the day. Start with, the, as Professor Mustafizur Rahman also mentioned, national resilience, then we go on to regional re resilience, and then a new global, global order is going to emerge. It will not be the same global order that was there before. Uh, you know, the globalization that we dealt with in the last half century or more, basically it, it made time and space meaningless. And because of that, we see everything collapsing because everybody was so integrally interdependent on each other. One part collapses, the rest, there's a domino effect. And that is what we are facing. We need, therefore, to come back to the national resilience, build our bridges through what Professor Mustafi Zuraman said, sets of a web of bilateral relationships. And I think Bangladesh showed, showed the way. You can't have multilateralism. You can't have trilateralism unless you have at least three good sets of bilateral relationships coming and meeting together. And we started that. For us, the most important bilateral relationship is with our immediate neighbors. And then we radiate out. So we started with Bangladesh, India. We go to BBIN, which is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, uh, and, and, and Nepal. Then it's, it's BIMSEC, in which the BBIN is four members out of seven. And now we are talking of Bay of Bengal, which is basically BBI, BIMSTEC Plus. That is how the progression of ideas, I think, in my mind takes place. When I embarked on this venture almost uh, 25 years ago, it was just an idea. It was an outrageous idea before its time. But as I said in the beginning in my opening remarks, a good idea never dies as long as you have some idiotic peoples pursuing it. And I think we have been doing that. We need to keep con continuing doing that. I, uh, in deference to the fact that we have, of the two special uh, guests we have, one is a guest in our country. I will give the floor to Ambassador Ito Naoki, a distinguished ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh. He kindly consented to join in, even though he is now in Tokyo. Uh, uh, Ito-san, the floor is yours, and thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. Ito-san. Are you there? You have, uh, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Karim. Uh, and uh, uh, Excellencies, distinguished uh, panelists and the participants. Uh, congratulations, uh, IUB and BIMRAD, uh, on the launching of the series of webinars on Bay of Bengal. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, for the kickoff uh, meeting uh, of, uh, uh, and allow me to say a few words. Uh, it is opportune to focus on the Bay of Bengal region from various perspectives. First and foremost, this is the region which has vibrant growth potentials. The center of gravity of the world economy is shifting towards Asia. And in fact, in the direction of Bay of Bengal. A Singaporean economist predicted the center of gravity would be located over the Himalayas in the near future. As Bangladesh, records the highest growth in Asia in this decade, it will accelerate the move closer to us. Then as the web web webinars take up, there are some areas which have been important for sustainable growth, but yet untouched or unexploited, such as blue economy, climate actions on effective mitigation and adaptation uh, certainly will require further attention in the region. Last but not least, geopolitical transformation of the world has impacted this region in recent years, in particular at the wake of the corona pandemic, as Foreign Secretary Momen uh, suggested earlier. On August the 5th, Prime Minister Abe said to Honorable Prime Minister Hashina that development of Bangladesh would contribute to the overall stability 
of Indo-Pacific region. We believe Honorable Prime Minister Ashina has the same perception. In May last year in Tokyo, the two prime ministers shared the idea of free and open Indo-Pacific, abbreviated FOIP or FOIP, as Foreign Secretary Momen succinctly summarized. Uh, I am of the view that the FOIP of free and open in the Pacific will be the key concept that serves everybody's interest uh, in the region to bring about win-win situation, in particular post-pandemic uh, situation. In October 1973, during his visit to Japan, Bongo Bondu uh, Mujibu Rahman said at Japan Press Club that we have declared that the Indian Ocean region must be a free and peaceful region. We want peace only for the development of these regions. I would say that you may see some similarity of thinking. Bearing in mind free and open in the Pacific, we can promote three pillars for the development, prosperity and peace in Bay of Bengal, which is of course an indispensable part of Indo-Pacific. First, development of regional economy through enhanced connectivity and the web of industry hubs. A notable example is the construction of deep sea port, power plants, and industrial facilities in Matabari under Big B, Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt Initiative, which was jointly launched by Prime Minister Abe and Honorable Prime Minister Hashina in 2014. Japan will continue to commit itself to the success of Big B. The Big B will be not only a game changer for Bangladesh economy, but also has a strategic reach, which makes the most of the ge geopolitical advantage Bangladesh has, namely connecting India and ASEAN and East Asia. I also expect BIMSTEC to play a larger role for regional connectivity. Second, Indo-Pacific can further promote as its governance framework, rule of law, free trade, including uh, RCEP, freedom of navigation, and rule-based maritime and international order. Neither unilateralism nor militarization is welcome. And Japan is concerned with the recent situation on both South China Sea and East China Sea. In contrast, the settlement of disputes regarding maritime border in Bay of Bengal through the permanent court of arbitration was a good illustration of commitment that Bangladesh has shown to rule of law and rule-based maritime order. Third, regional peace and stability. Regional peace and stability that lead to attain human security beyond borders. I would say poverty-free socioeconomic development across the Bay of Bengal region, disaster prevention, climate actions, and humanitarian assistance are important prerequisites. To ensure human security, we need to protect people, empower people, and provide opportunities for capacity building. Currently, Rohingya refugee issues are our common and acute concern. Lasting solution to the issues will be instrumental in stabilizing the Bay of Bengal region and enhancing the level of human security there. Japan will continue to support Bangladesh for its efforts and cooperate with Bangladesh to create an enabling environment for repatriation. I might add that since free and open in the Pacific is an inclusive and universal vision to deepen regional cooperation, we have no intention to exclude any single country. In concluding my remarks, I wish to underline that Japan, together with Bangladesh, would like to build free and open in the Pacific, with particular focus on the Bay of Bengal region. I wish IUB and BIMRAD a great success of webinars through constructive and engaging discussions on relevant themes to further development, prosperity, and peace of the Bay of Bengal region. I look forward to further collaboration and cooperation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ambassador Naoki, for your uh, invaluable and inspiring remarks and your very candid and forthright uh, uh, comments uh, in you know, putting forward your country's vision of uh, your role, uh, not just in Bangladesh, but in the region as a whole. And I, I deeply welcome uh, from the bottom of my heart, your offer to continue to remain engaged with us as we go forward uh, on our path that we have just embarked on. Um, uh, as you rightly said, I mean, you pointed to the Indo-Pacific and indeed the Bay of Bengal and Bangladesh were at the heart of the Indo-Pacific almost until almost a century ago. That was the Indo-Pacific, which was undefined as Indo-Pacific at that time. We were the connectivity between the West and the East. At that time, of course, the British used this as a, a, a mode, uh, a, a pathway to extraction. Now we are seeking to use this as a pathway to mutual regional development for the betterment of our peoples. We were also an integral part of the silk route at the time when the silk and cotton products, the famous products from Bengal, reached the markets in Europe through the ancient Silk Road, which goes back centuries. So in a sense, that's what I was alluding to, that for us, these are not competing narratives. These are complementary narratives, and we are part of both. We heartily subscribe to both. As our father of the nation said, friendship to all and malice to none. Either or is not an option or a solution for us. And, and we certainly look forward to being a part of the Indo-Pacific, as well as cooperating in aspects of the BRI that suit our national interests. And we hope that Japan will continue to walk along the path with us. Thank you, Ito-san. I call on Ambassador Shahidul Islam. He is a, a distinguished colleague of mine. We had the, I had the privilege of serving with him uh, long ago in Washington, to which he is actually now going back as ambassador. You know, uh, an assignment to Washington is considered uh, the, the sort of the, the apotheosis of one's diplomatic career, rightly or wrongly. Uh, and, and he has served his post as Secretary General of BIMSTEC, trying to revive this organization and its ethos in his term here. Uh, so, uh, the Washington's gain is BIMSTEC's loss, but we continue to remain engaged as friends. Ambassador Shahidul Islam. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, very kind uh, words, uh, uh, which uh, shows the affection that uh, I always uh, get from you as your junior colleague. Uh, His Excellency Professor uh, Dr. Gaho Rizvi, Honorable International Affairs uh, Advisor to the Honorable Prime Minister and uh, Chief Guest of today's uh, webinar, Vice Chancellor Dr. Uh, Milan Pagun, uh, Foreign Secretary Ambassador Masud bin Momen, uh, Special Guests, uh, uh, Distinguished Panelists, uh, good afternoon. The Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, or uh, BIMSTEC, the regional organization uh, that I represent here, is closely associated with the Bay of Bengal. Uh, BIMSTEC is uh, composed of seven member states that are either littoral or adjacent to the Bay of Bengal, forming a community of Bay of Bengal nations. Many of the BIM, BIMSTEC's uh, areas of cooperation, including trade, transport, and communication, tourism, fisheries, counterterrorism, and transnational crime, climate change, environment, and disaster management are directly linked with the Bay of Bengal. Uh, BIMSTEC's uh, approach uh, to the Bay of Bengal uh, can uh, broadly be divided into four levels. Uh, to begin with, uh, BIMSTEC looks at uh, the Bay of Bengal as a means to promote uh, physical and economic connectivity. In the post-COVID-19 pandemic period, sea routes will become more important to ensure uninterrupted uh, supply chains. 
BIMSTEC is uh, currently negotiating postal shipping agreement to facilitate uh, maritime trade uh, within the region. Maritime connectivity may also become the preferred alternative to connect uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia uh, to avoid the high cost and uh, political sensitivities that are associated with uh, land transport connectivity. For instance, uh, Ranon Port of Thailand has signed MOU with India's uh, three ports, Chennai, Visakhapatnam, and Kolkata, and Sri Lanka's Hambantoto port. Thailand has also proposed to conclude similar MOUs with Chattogram port of Bangladesh and Sitwe port of Myanmar. It is also noteworthy that the ongoing BIMSTEC master plan on transport connectivity has emphasized uh, the development of inland waterways involving Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, India, Myanmar, and Nepal. This will facilitate access to the Bay of Bengal by Bhutan and Nepal and the northeastern region of India. Secondly, uh, BIMSTEC looks at the Bay of Bengal as a space for economic activities. Almost uh, 200 million people live along the Bay of Bengal's coast, and the major proportion of them are either partially or wholly dependent on the Bay for their livelihoods. BIMSTEC leaders during the Goa retreat in 2016 recognized the enormous potential that the development of the blue economy holds for our region and agreed to explore ways to deepen cooperation in areas uh, such as uh, aquaculture, hydrography, seabed mineral exploration, coastal shipping, ecotourism, and renewable ocean energy in order to promote sustainable development. BIMSTEC has established an expert group to develop an action plan on blue economy. The third point is uh, BIMSTEC looks at the Bay of Bengal as an ecosystem that influences the lives and livelihoods of the millions of people around the Bay. The Port BIMSTEC Summit expressed serious concern over uh, environmental degradation, adverse impact of climate change, and global warming on the fragile Himalayan and mountain ecosystem and their interlinkages with the Bay of Bengal. The leaders also called for closer cooperation in disaster management through sharing of information, including early warning system, adoption of preventive measures, rehabilitation and capacity building. The BIMSTEC expert group on disaster management cooperation has been established to develop a plan of action to improve preparedness and coordination for responding to natural disasters in the Bay of Bengal region. Last but uh, very importantly, uh, BIMSTEC is working towards uh, developing the Bay of Bengal as a common security space, which is exposed to traditional and non-traditional security threats, including uh, illegal fishing, uh, armed robbery, drug, arms, and human trafficking. The first meeting of the BIMSTEC National Security Chiefs held in Italy in 2017 emphasized the importance of maritime security in view of the overwhelming significance of the Bay of Bengal for the well-being, prosperity, security, and socioeconomic development in the BIMSTEC member states. The meeting also decided to prepare a comprehensive plan of action to enhance maritime security cooperation among them. If we look at uh, the response of Bangladesh uh, uh, to all these uh, areas uh, involving cooperation in BIMSTEC, uh, Bay of Bengal region. Uh, we see that Bangladesh uh, has been taking uh, uh, a very uh, a good approach, uh, uh, adequate approach. Uh, so far, it has, uh, it has been uh, uh, very satisfactory. Uh, Bangladesh's uh, geographical location, demography, economy, environmental sustainability, and national security will uh, demand its uh, proactive involvement 
in setting uh, economic and security agenda of the Bay of Bengal, uh, uh, using all available platforms, including uh, BIMSTEC. Uh, so far, uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, is moving in the right direction as far as its uh, cooperation with BIMSTEC is concerned. Earlier this, this year, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh stressed the need to conclude the BIMSTEC coastal shipping agreement to improve economic connectivity in the region. We hope that the proposed MOU between uh, Ranon Port of Thailand and Chattogram Port of Bangladesh uh, will be concluded soon. Bangladesh has been very forthcoming in facilitating uh, Bhutan and the northeastern region of India to have access to the Bay of Bengal. Bangladesh has greatly succeeded in reviving its past glory as a leading shipbuilding nation. The existing seaports uh, are being upgraded and new ones are being constructed to conduct its uh, foreign trade uh, more efficiently. It is heartening to see that uh, Bangladesh is uh, building its capacity to develop blue economy by establishing various institutions, including Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman Maritime University. Bardem and the Bay of Bengal Institute uh, uh, to be set up at IUB are examples of the progress Bangladesh is making in enhancing awareness of the Bay of Bengal. The Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, in collaboration with the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, uh, conducted a fishery survey in the Bay of Bengal involving Bangladesh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. The survey results uh, could possibly be a good uh, basis for uh, further work in uh, fisheries uh, area, which is uh, vitally important for blue economy. Bangladesh is also building the capacity of its coast guard to contain illegal, unreported, and unregulated uh, fishing piracy, search and rescue of fishermen, intercept drug and human trafficking on the sea. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have almost completed my remarks uh, without mentioning the word strategy uh, to keep things uh, simple. Almost uh, all discussions on the Bay of Bengal uh, tend to begin with its increasing geopolitical and geostrategic uh, significance due to the shifting of global power structure. Uh, while well, that is a very important way of looking at the Bay of Bengal from a broader perspective, uh, it is also important that the littoral states uh, develop their own narrative of how they want to see the Bay of Bengal. Bangladesh may host uh, more and more conference and uh, workshops uh, like the webinar of today involving government officials, scholars, academia, and think tanks in order to develop its own narrative by the uh, uh, narrative of the Bay of Bengal. I am confident that the establishment of the Bay of Bengal Institute at IUB is going to be a major step uh, towards uh, that direction. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador Shahidul Islam. Uh, I see that you have not let the grass grow under your feet during your tenure. Uh, Beamstech had actually gone into a stage of hibernation almost for 20 years after its establishment. And uh, I think in a, in a sense, a reflection of better or uh, more uh, uh, integrated or intense bilateral ties developing, it has expanded. And I think you mentioned an important component, the, the coastal shipping arrangements that presently exist bilaterally between Bangladesh and India after a disruption of almost 70 years and between India and Myanmar, that Thailand is also now uh, uh, probably going to become a part of the arrangement. The Sri Lankans had uh, you know, uh, shown keenness on joining this. This is restoring basically the Indo-Pacific that existed historically, uh, because that is where it all led to. It, the, the, it, it joined, it went up to Singapore in those days 
until 19, the late 1940s, until the middle of the last century. Uh, so thank you for your valuable remarks. And uh, I'm sure the foundations that you have laid for this organization will now be further developed and consolidated by your successor who comes soon. But that even though you leave our region, you will be playing a very, very important role in your next assignment uh, in Washington, uh, getting, uh, making them understand that the region has indeed holistic uh, dynamics that need to be factored in. And, and uh, uh, a, a region of peace and prosperity and stability serves the interest in of the entire globe. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll come to Professor Grisby, but I briefly, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our third collaborative partner this, this morning, uh, Professor Salim ul uh, He will be leading the discussions actually in the second series of the webinars we are having uh, on the uh, 22nd of September, uh, which will be on, uh, focusing on the ecological aspects of uh, and, and environmental aspects. And this is an area which we will delve into in depth. Uh, every speaker has mentioned that, touched on that importance. Uh, so before I go to Dr. Rizvi, who will, if you will indulge me, uh, may I ask Dr. Professor Salim ul -Haq just to, a couple of minutes of quick remarks, and then we'll go to for and have Dr. Gohar Rizvi give the final words. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Karim. It's been a pleasure uh, <coughs> listening to this opening uh, webinar that you have uh, very kindly organized and all the eminent speakers. So as uh, you have just briefly mentioned, my work is and my center, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, which is part of the Independent University of Bangladesh, is very proud to be part of this tripartite uh, collaboration with BIMRAD, IUB, and ICAD. Um, and in next week, I hope to share with everybody a sort of scientific uh, environmental and climate change perspective on the issues surrounding the Bay of Bengal starting with the global science on climate change. I think a little bit on that, I won't do too much. Uh, and then the relevance for the region uh, that we are concerned about, the Bay of Bengal region, uh, particularly the potential impacts of cyclonic storms like we had very recently with Amphan, which are likely to be enhanced as well as floods that we are seeing right now. And then moving forward in terms of what we can do to use this a problem of climate change as an opportunity for uh, seeking out uh, cooperation and collaboration between the countries. I believe this adds a new uh, uh, strengthening of the need for collaboration and cooperation that we can use to our advantage, for all our advantage in the region. Uh, so that's it for now. I look forward to participating in the next uh, webinar and sharing some more thoughts. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, Salim. And now, May I request Dr. Uh, Professor Gohar Rizvi to come in and share his wisdom and, and his inspiration with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tariq Bhai. Uh, the chairman of the uh, board of the Independent University, Mateen Chowdhury, uh, uh, the vice chancellor of IUB, Admiral Nizam, Professor Salim ul Haq, Ambassador Shahidul Islam, and so many friends uh, who are all gathered in different places. I must say the last 45 minutes that I have been with this conference have been extraordinarily uh, enriching. So I thank you all for uh, inviting me to it and also giving me an opportunity to share a few words. Uh, earlier, uh, listening to uh, Mustafiz, I was uh, uh, really very excited at the breadth of his uh, vision for the work that you are about to uh, undertake. Uh, and then uh, uh, that was followed by another very, very interesting presentation by Professor Imtiaz to have the support of the Japanese ambassador to this uh, initiative. And last but not least, 
uh, uh, Shahid, uh, I must say, I have been uh, uh, watching uh, your work at Bimstech ever almost from the day you arrived. And it would not be exaggerating to say, any exaggeration to say that, my God, what a wonderful uh, work you have done and you have put Bimstech on the map. So thank you. And also best wishes to you as you proceed to Washington. Uh, I, let me say a word first uh, of, of uh, thanks to uh, Mateen. I have had the privilege of knowing Mateen since he was a very young man and have had the privilege of uh, working with him now like here and there. And I can tell you with great honesty that there are fewer people with uh, a vision as large as his, but at the same time, the extraordinary capacity of making things happen. The fact that we are today uh, in this seminar, of course, Tarek Bhai has been pushing for it in, in different ways, but we largely owe to the dynamism of Mateen. Mateen, thank you for making it uh, uh, happen. And I also know as you remain engaged with it, uh, there is no option but to uh, succeed. I'm not, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we have already heard an enormous amount of the importance of the Bay of Bengal, its importance and the opportunities that it presents to us, those of us who are in Bangladesh and around uh, in uh, uh, the region of uh, Bay of Bengal. That is uh, already has been covered and I don't want to go there uh, very much. I will focus only on one and one issue and that is the importance of knowledge building. We are all very excited. We are all very, uh, 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 we all know in our guts that Bay of Bengal uh, 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 presents an extraordinary opportunity. But the reality is also, we know very little about it. Very little about the economic opportunities that is present. We know very little of how this region will be able to prosper and develop given the competing geostrategic competitions that is uh, going around that. And in many ways, uh, Professor Imtiaz's, the title of his, uh, paper actually sums up our problem that there is a, a, a huge opportunity, but as of, as of now, we know only bits and pieces about it and not uh, the entirety. So therefore, that defines the urgency of creating an institution like this, an interdisciplinary institution where scholars and practitioners from different disciplines and different fields will be able to come together and create a knowledge and understanding based on science and empirical evidence. All too often, all too often, unfortunately, uh, we forget the importance of research and knowledge uh, uh, building. Because uh, whatever we do, will depend on the quality of information, quality of analysis that is produced to help those who are endeavoring to make this uh, uh, a Bay of Bengal initiative uh, happen. So for that reason, I not only congratulate the independent university, uh, congratulate uh, Admiral uh, uh, Nizam's Bangladesh Institute of Maritime Development and Research, and indeed, Salim al Haq's own initiative of uh, international cooperation in climate change. You have got the three really good uh, institutions together. Uh, this is in itself uh, an achievement. Now, the problem for us are twofold. One is to fi finding the right people. Uh, in Institutions do not make people, people make institutions. So unless we can tap 
brilliant scholars. Uh, today, Bangladesh is fortunate. We have a, a new generation which has come, some of them highly trained in different parts of the world, and who are waiting to make a contribute, their contribution uh, to the country and the region. And I hope you will be able uh, to somehow bring them in and constantly bear in mind the importance of interdisciplinary, joint disciplinary work. Without doubt, a, a, a Bay of Bengal cannot be understood through the perspective of a single or couple of disciplines. It really, really requires a multi. -day. The other important point is that sadly, uh, although this meeting is definitely saying that what I'm saying is probably irrelevant, it is that the relationship between policy makers and policy analysts is weak. We, we operate in two different uh, world. We do not speak to each other. And uh, for various reasons, right or wrong, the policy makers are often dismissive of uh, 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 acad academic institutions and their contribution. They probably have a good reason why they are sometimes, but also I think it is a culture. We do not know how to speak to, to uh, each other. And through seminars like this, if you can bring uh, 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 both sides of the community into the room, the end result will be far, far better. And, uh, 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 and the results would be utilized. My final uh, point, and I won't uh, uh, labor it too long, ultimately everything depends on the quality of your work. Often when we think of talking about uh, policy research, there is a tendency amongst researcher to uh, second guess what the policy makers or administrations want. The result is, A, you don't know what they want. B, the quality of your work suffers. So soundness and the empirical basis of research is what the institutions can provide. And if you can provide that, there is no reason why the policy makers will not come knocking at your door for advice and for information and for a policy option. So th that is why. Uh, I could have said other things, but as I'm going back to my uh, previous uh, life, I know that ultimately uh, the quality of research matters. And today's complexity requires that we approach this from a multidisciplinary perspective, without which uh, we will end up uh, uh, like a blind man and the uh, elephant. So I will encourage you to bring that. I won't uh, uh, prolong this anymore. There are other speeches to, uh, and, and uh, papers to come, but to thank you all again. Motin, I really, really thank you. I don't see the vice chancellor uh, photograph here, but uh, I also really thank your vice chancellor for taking this very, very timely initiative. You can see there are other academic institutions which are willing and happy to cooperate with you. A little while ago, we heard the Japanese ambassador and his and a, a great support. So congratulations, thank you, best of luck. And I do hope this institute uh, will take off, uh, uh, fully evolve and contribute to an area for which we are all very, very much invested. Thank you, everybody. Joy Bangla, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Gohar Rizvi. Gohar, my old friend, uh, your words are inspirational as always. We take heart from them, and we will listen to your words of uh, counsel. Uh, I'm sure that IUB as an institution and its partners will take them seriously and uh, in, in charting our way forward. It uh, now, we have come to the end of an extremely enriching, illuminating and, and uh, 
uh, a seminar which had a vision far beyond my expectations. I wish to thank everyone for their invaluable contributions. And we all became, in a sense, more enriched than we were when we came in first. Uh, everyone has added a dimension of, of which we were not individually or personally aware. Uh, uh, I think the point that Professor Brisby mentioned, and that is something which I have come to appreciate myself, uh, having bridged both the world of academia and professional uh, diplomacy, is how we have always tended to maintain a distance from each other. The, what you mentioned is, is that policymakers and policy analysts live in two different silos. And I appreciated it only when I went, left diplomacy to go to academia, how much more enriched I became by being part of academia. And then when I came back again to diplomacy, how that actually helped me in take many things forward. This has been sadly lacking. And, and particularly, I think uh, we in Bangladesh who aspire to be a bridge country, not just in the region, but between regional powers. That's our ultimate goal and ambition. Uh, we, we would do well in future to, to uh, uh, not just lessen the gap, but actually do away with this gap. And, and uh, you know, uh, with people like you leading the way uh, and, and uh, giving us encouragement, I hope this process will continue. A lot of things have been said, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it would be futile on my part to try and summarize everything. But, you know, the Bay of Bengal for Bangladesh, uh, what was described as a hackneyed phrase, as the emerging tiger. Okay. It's, it's the sheer entrepreneurial quality of the individual in Bangladesh that has come to light. Now what we need to do is put in place a system of governance which will harness and channelize that towards a purpose-driven goal. And that is what Bangladesh, I think, is poised to do. Uh, you know, the, all these individual flurries of energy that you will see if you walk the streets of Dhaka, you will see that. We need to bring that and harness that and channelize that and take it forward. We need to define our goals and we need to say that is where we all need to go. And that is where informed, uh, uh, you know, uh, options for policymakers will be useful. Uh, as, as Professor Rizvi very rightly said, it's a quotable quote, institutions do not make people, people make institutions. What institutions do is provide the framework where people can come in and realize self-fulfillment, where countries and organizations can come in and realize self-fulfillment. Of course, they need resources. And, you know, I, I warmly welcome you know, the, the hand of friendship that uh, Ambassador Itunaoki has uh, is, is stressed out. We have three series, uh, three more uh, webinars coming up in this series. The next one will be devoted to in, in ecological and environmental aspects. And there are very serious aspects and dimensions which we need to take note of. The next one will be on economics. Now people talk of blue economy, but then, Blue economy means you need a golden goose which actually lives. If the ecology and the environment do not enable it to live, if, if the golden goose is, co co uh, is killed before it is able to lay the eggs, we have no eggs to harvest. And that is the relationship. And then the last one, the, the, uh, so the economy, the blue economy one is on the 29th. And then the final one in the series is on the 6th of October. Uh, which is which brings in the regional dimensions. What does the Bay of Bengal mean, not just for Bangladesh, but for all its landlocked neighbors and all its literal neighbors? And by literal neighbors, I'm now looking at Bimstek plus configuration. We need also to bring in all the countries, who's doing what and who's not doing, which is actually contributing or not contributing to sustained health and viability of the Bay. Uh, because ultimately, as has been said repeatedly by all the speakers, we are living, the, the ecology is a commons. 
there has to be ecology uh, the uh, survival of humankind of species and indeed of this world depends on our maintaining a very delicate balance which holds everything together you upset one part of the balance everything else will ultimately keep crashing down and that has to be understood so this partnership actually also brings three key players organizations who will come with their minds and their uh, intellectual capacities uh, uh, and and their ideas to try and put together what we so far have been dealing with in isolated silos i look at silos you know you have these configurations in the children's playground there are boxes and children cross we are not living in boxes we are living from one box to the other the ch child crawls across from one box to the other we have to be able to do that and once we are able to interconnect these different institutions then only we will understand the the value of looking at things holistically so my deep gratitude first to iub for hosting this and i think it will be it is the the forerunner of many seminars to come once we have a center in place over the next couple of years we will devise in depth discussions we will have cross fertilization of ideas coming not just from our three institutions working together but drawing in intellectual brains from across the nation as well as from across the region and beyond because much scholarship has been done across but it's, they have always been done all been done in a very scattered uncoordinated way uh, uh, much work has already been done we have to find those and bring it and collate it uh, we uh, i thank uh, 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 admiral nizam i thank our chairman for taking uh, a deep personal interest in this matter and being here sitting with us patiently uh, uh, you know for the last Pleasure. almost two hours i thank our chief guest dr professor gohar rizvi who not only kept his commitment for his inspirational remarks i thank ambassador ito and ambassador shahidul islam and last but not least i thank our academics uh, and of course the foreign secretary once again i thank you for actually in the midst of your uh, you know preoccupations and i know how foreign secretaries can be you know contesting and juggling between times and schedules not only being with us from 11 o'clock onwards uh, dhaka time 8 o'clock onwards ankara time where you are <laughs> my heart almost sank when you told me a day before that i'm leaving for ankara tomorrow but then thank you for keeping your commitment and for delivering thank to you. us a brilliant keynote speech i think we will take the many points that you have enumerated to heart over here and and try and parse them and work out how we will do our agenda for the future so thank you all very much i now declare the seminar closed professor rizvi can you see me now yes uh, i am so delighted to see you i uh, not seeing you i began to miss you so thank you for <laughs> And Muthi, onik dhonu bab, you have thank made you. such a record time. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Since we have a uh, time, Sorry. let me just take one minute, if I could. See, we've all been in the government, and when we retired, then only we realized that the knowledge is outside the government. So, what is important, because you know, the advocates of outside knowledge, like today, we have the admiral, we have the ambassador, we have all of these people. They come in and talk about knowledge outside the government. And I'm sure Mustafiz and Salim are laughing at what I'm saying. Yes, we who have served in the government tend to feel, once we are in the government, that all the knowledge is within the government. So it's, I think, very important that we go down to a mid-level and try to induce this thought that the knowledge is not only within the government. And if we can cooperate, that is the only way Bangladesh will go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any any final thoughts from anybody? Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good office. Thank, Thank you office. very much. Bye. Good. Thank Good you. Good Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to joining up with you, Ito-san, when you are back. <laughs> yeah, we'll 